Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by BlackRifleCoffee.com. Put down the water and grab a fucking drink. Drink, 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 drink. Hello. Patrick Gordon. Yes, sir. How are you? We are live on Drinking Bros Podcast. You are our 2018 Brosman winner of the year. How the fuck did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I, look, that's a that's a great question, and and I'm actually glad you brought it up. Um, you you personally, not me, because I, what you're going through is extraordinary, and the fact that you've been so open about it, uh, everybody in the Drinking Bros community has has messaged us um, for a while now, saying, "Look, this is this is your Brosman winner of the year." Um, Tell the audience exactly what it is you're going through for people who don't, uh, who, who maybe not, might not know your story. Uh, well, um, in 2008, I was diagnosed with rectal cancer. Um, and uh, it's been an ongoing fight. I'm a double metastasis. It went to my liver and now both lungs. And uh, two and a half months ago, they gave me three months to live. And uh, they're wrong again. I still feel great. Yeah, you sound great. And and earlier in the day, we had chatted. And I, I when we got off the phone, I, I talked to my wife, and I just said, "Man, this guy sounds so full of life. There's no way he's got only a couple weeks left to live. This just doesn't seem possible." Do you think that that the doctors could be wrong? And have they been wrong before? Uh, you know what? I wouldn't call it wrong. Um, They've been pretty spot on, but it's impossible to give times on these things because everybody's different. So, you know, I can't, I can't really say right or wrong. I just, you know, a, a long time ago, I don't know what it was or who told it to me, um, but somebody told me once that. If you're always living in fear of what's going to happen tomorrow, you can't get through today. And I guess that's probably the best way to manage a fear is forget about it. So ever since I've been diagnosed, I mean, there have been times when it was uh, obviously stressful. There were the, the initial diagnosis. I was 38 years old. I'd only been married eight months. We were down at the Indy 500 partying for five days, and I went in the porta potty, and uh, I took a shit, and about a quart of blood came out, and I started having really bad abdominal pains. So I just chalked it up to um, eating brats and beer for four days, and uh, just went home. Never thought about it again. But my new wife um, kept yelling at me. I needed to go in and get checked. And that's what came out of it. So I don't know, man, it, you, you got to live each day. I mean, if you're worried about tomorrow, you're never going to get through it today. So I guess I just, I go to bed at night, hope I wake up and the next day, if I feel okay, I feel okay. If I don't, I just nap through it and start over the next day. Uh, and are you currently at home or are you, are you in the hospital? No, I'm at home. I'm at home. I was in there for a little while yesterday for some stupid stuff, but it uh, it wasn't anything serious. I, I had tubes put in my lungs to drain off the excess fluid that's been building, and uh, that way I can drain at home every few days, and uh, it decompresses the lung and allows me to breathe a little better and have more comfort. comfort. But Apparently, my insides are just as ridiculous as the outside, and I keep getting debris, and it clogs the tubes, so now I have to go in every time anyway. So, Man. I was in there all day yesterday having them melt off the crap that builds up in the tubes. So, Man, uh, this is... Look, I, I've I've personally never done an interview like this before. Um, I greatly appreciate you taking the time today to do this. Um, I, I, if it's okay with you, I, I'd like to just ask you about your life. 
Um, where, where <laughs> I, I would, um, I, look, you're uh, obviously we say this all the time on the show and we mean it. Uh, drinking bros <laughs> is more than a community. It's, it's family. And everywhere you go, that there's a drinking bro. You know that you'll have somebody to hang out with somebody to have a beer with, uh, somebody to talk to. We help each other in this community. Um, I know initially you were reluctant to have a GoFundMe page started or any of that stuff. Uh, across the board, because I've been following in your story uh, in Drinking Bros' uh, main page, which is on Facebook, and um, but the other members were like, "No, Patrick, like we we need to do something for you. We need to help you." Um, first of all, how did you get into the Drinking Bros community? Oh, uh, some asshole invited me. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, honestly, I I just got a text one day from. Uh, a guy I grew up with in uh, Montana, Robert Julian. And, uh, he said, Hey man, you got to join this. It's hilarious. So I joined and initially, you know, I started going through the page a little bit here and there. I I honestly don't spend a ton of time on Facebook or I hadn't, Sure. you know, I, I'm your average repost the funny memes and say something brilliant once in a while to to make everyone (laughs) laugh and then just get the hell off of there and go about my business. But, uh, Robert, uh, sent a text and said, dude, you got to join this. He sent me an invite. So I just jumped on there and, you know, initially I just, I, I was laughing so hard because everyone's such a dick on there sometimes oh yeah it's it's, you know it's brutal but but hilarious obviously yeah and i just kind of fit right in so (laughs) you know i made my initial few snide comments and and then just kind of watched and laughed for a couple months and then i i was in a clinical trial which i didn't qualify for but they let me try anyway it was some kind of new genetic drug thing that teaches your own body to fight your cancer, but cancers come in a couple forms. And, uh, I guess the easiest way that it was ever explained to me was there's hot and cold tumors and a hot tumor means that, uh, your body can see and react to it. And I have cold tumors, which means my tumors are an exact genetic match to my body. So my immune system can't see or fight it or even know that it's there. So the theory in this clinical trial was to, um, uh, they radiate your tumors with high dose radiation over the course of a week. And then you go in for all these long infusions where you sit in a chair under an IV bag and um, it had no effect. So, one morning I woke up and I I was on my way in to the hospital. My wife had gone to work and it was results day. And I had a little, little stressful morning that morning. So I just posted on Facebook that I could use some good thoughts for the day. And for some reason, I just switched over to drinking bros and put it on there as well. I figured what can it hurt to have a little bit of extra prayers or help or you know, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, by the time I drove from here to Chicago, I'm only about an hour away. Um, I must've had 250 messages or responses to that post. Really? Oh, easily within an hour. So that made the uh, waiting room experience a lot more fun because I had something to do. And then uh, by the end of all the appointments that day and the bad news and I drove home and um, I didn't really want to tell my friends and family that night. I wanted to think it over for a night and uh, I wanted to be able to tell my family and my wife first before I went out and, and told everyone. And, it, you know, it's funny because my wife gets mad. Facebook isn't really the place she wants me to put all the medical stuff or personal that personal anyway. But what I've found is if I don't tell people on Facebook, I have to answer 500 calls right? and re and re explain everything. So my theory is it's a bandaid, tear it off, get it out there 
and then you can deal with the aftermath. So anyway, I got home and I didn't go back online. So I was going to wait the night through and I started getting PM'd over and over and over. I must have had another, I don't know, 50 messages. What were the results? What happened to you? So then I had to go back on and and uh, tell everyone. So then I started receiving more messages and friend requests. I must have added, God, probably 50 new people off of Drinking Bros. Right. And now if I disappear for a day, I get messages and, and all kinds of shit asking where I'm at, what's going on, come back and tell us more. So I do keep coming back to it. And it's it's kind of fun, but... Well, look, it's, it, you know, everybody's, everybody loves you and everybody loves everyone inside the drinking bros community and is genuinely worried. Um, so I, it's hard to look at that as, as a negative people really do love you and are concerned. Hey man, are you, are you with us today? You know? Yeah, I know. It, but it's funny. I never expected that. I just, you know, I was hoping for a few prayers and some, some, I don't know, just good thoughts for the day. And, and this is what turned out of it. So it's awesome. Um, what really keeps me coming back though are the um, private messages I get from people going through horrible things as well. And uh, I don't know why. I, I don't feel that I'm really that strong. It's something that was thrown in my lap and I have to do it. Right. You know what I mean? You. I, I, <laughs> You just have to do it. There's not, there's no other choice other than to move forward. Um, so I do, and I'm not going to quit doing the things I love and I'm not going to quit doing the things I like to do until I can't do them. So I just get up every day and do it. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, one of the main reasons why everybody says, you know, you're so brave is that you're willing to share your story every single day with people. Cause it's like you said, a lot of people are, you know, they turn on Facebook for a meme here and there and that's it. But you know, there's a, there is a lot of people going through a lot of hard stuff, uh, and life threatening stuff, you know, same as you, but once one person puts it out there, then that one person is able to help everybody else. Because I'm sure you're flooded with the same questions of, Hey man, what are you going through mentally right now? How do I get through my situation? Um, because it, it really does help. I mean, you know, on, on, Dude, the, I've been, on the morbid I've been brain dead, I've been brain dead since 1987. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure what my mind is going through. Well, it's, it's one of those things too, where you, you have the curiosity of, you know, you, I think everybody's been faced with this question their entire life of, what would you do if you knew you, you only had a certain amount of time left on this earth? You're one of the, the, the very few people that can answer that. Um, what, are, what are you doing with your time left? I lay around on the couch a lot and watch TV. Uh, this morning I was out trying to shoot a squirrel for the dog because she was going ape shit. You know, just normal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, honestly, man, uh, because I had to retire early and it was unplanned and everything, you know, your, your finances dry up in a hurry. I think I, yeah, I don't want to get into specifics, but I had a nice bank account. I was 38 when I got married, I paid for our house, uh, down payment was cash. The wedding was cash. So we went into our marriage debt free and I still had, you know, a chunk of change left over. But as soon as that diagnosis hits and you're taking, months and months off work for treatments because I was a full-time firefighter at the time and you're not running into fires while you're wearing a chemo backpack, you know? Sure. Um, and after all the, God, I've had so many surgeries, it's ridiculous. So I think the longest period of time I was down while I was working was eight months, but you know, during that time they moved me into the inspection department and I worked days and I did my treatments and then I'd go right back to work, uh, even the same day. Wow. What, 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 what fire, what city and fire department do you work at? Uh, Michigan city, Indiana. Okay. So, you know, I just kept plugging along. And then when I got, 
when I healed up enough and those doctors released me, I'd go right back on to, you know, right on back on shift and go back to doing what I did. And eventually, you know, at the dub, at the second metastasy, when it got to my lungs, they told me I would only live two years. And, uh, at that point it, it was just kind of a moot point. It was time to retire. So you just kind of stop doing what you're doing. Um, I took out a couple loans on my uh, life insurance policy, took my wife on a long vacation. I took her out to Montana so she could see where I grew up. She got to meet quite a few of my old friends that were still uh, around out there. Some of the ranches I worked on. Um, we just had a great three and a half week vacation out there and came back. But as far as like bucket list items, uh, I've lived my life like it's a bucket list. So. You have. That's great because that, that was my next question because, you know, a lot of people don't. And then it seems to be too late once they have, you know, or once they get news like this or information, then it's just like, all right, well, great. I got to try to jam all these great things that I never got to do into my life immediately. You did do that growing growing up and everything? You know, I did. As, I, I was an idiot. To be honest with you, I I was the class clown a lot. Didn't take much serious. Even in the military, I fuck I'm eighty five and got busted back to E three. So I was an E three twice, an E four twice, and an E five once in four years. So I I just always kind of I was kind of a free spirit. I just did what the hell I wanted. To do. <laughs> was it fighting? What was it? What what kept getting you knocked back down? <laughs> yeah, that one might have been a little bit of fighting and a fake ID. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always <laughs> fighting. <laughs> I got away. I got away with the fight. It was the fake ID I had in my wallet that really got me in the tr- trouble. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was an intelligence specialist, so I had SCI clearance and. That just didn't go over too well in the intel community. Yeah, I can't imagine it would. I can't imagine it would. Uh, Although I worked with I worked with the Marines almost exclusively, and uh, they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like going to a new command and a a gunny and a top sergeant walk in and see an E3 sitting in the intelligence officer's chair. <laughs> and they go, uh, where's the intelligence officer? I said, you're looking at him, Gunny. And he goes, he goes, oh, shit, I'm going to love you. <laughs> First words out of his mouth. We're going to get along just fine. <laughs> and there is absolutely no better feeling than walking through a base with one stripe and three service stripes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, let's look. Let's start from the beginning of your life. Where, where, where are you from originally? Where were you born? Well, I was born in, uh, I was born at home in Rosemont, Mon- uh, Minnesota. Okay. In, and, uh, I Wh- came where out is of- that? I actually don't know where that is. Jeez. I don't even remember <laughs> <laughs> how far away from Minneapolis. I think that's pretty much the gauge that everybody uses. Yeah. You know what? I'm not even sure anymore. I, I left there when I was three or okay. third, second grade. Um, not too far, maybe 80 miles or less. So, All right. um, and then where, where'd dad, you, where'd you go to after that? And then, uh, we moved out to uh coal strip, Montana. It's, it's small coal mining town. It has an electric fired plant, uh, coal fired electric plant there that provides electricity to pretty much Montana and the Northwest. And it provides coal to almost everywhere in the country. My dad worked as a safety manager for the power plant there, so a public utility company. Let me ask you this. And, is, uh, uh, is is Montana really God's country? Is it as beautiful, beautiful as everybody says it is? No, it sucks. Tell everyone you know. <laughs> really? You're the first person who said that. <laughs> it's, a wor- it's the worst place on earth. You don't want to go there. That's what any real Montana will tell you. Uh, what, why, why is that? Cause you don't want anybody else to move there and know about it or, or you well, just... I'm going to, I'm going to offend like half of the podcast, but it's because the Californians just inundate the place. And now they're, they've 
increase the property values ah, tremendously. There it is. I, you know, you're not you're not going to offend half the podcast. <laughs> Fuck the people who live in California. Look, I used right? to live in California. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I, like I, I understand it. I wouldn't want them living there either because a, a, a lot of things they don't tell you about California because they're moving north because it's too expensive to live there as well. So yeah, like, they are. Oregon and Portland in particular, if they see a California plate, they are smashing your vehicle, cutting your tires. <laughs> like, I understand it. I wouldn't want those mo- those motherfuckers in Montana either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's been the ongoing thing for so many years is tell everyone Montana sucks. <laughs> I knew it because no. everybody else who lives there is like, man, it is the most beautiful place in the United think, States. And yeah. I think it's probably my only regret was leaving there. But there's, you know, when I lived there, there was very little work. The number, the largest employer in Montana was the government. So the, there just wasn't a lot of work. It's it's so much ranch land. They only have, you know, three cities that are over a hundred thousand population. Even still, when I left when I left Montana, the state still had under a million population. Wow! So to me, it's perfect. I freaking loved it. Of course, growing up, I couldn't wait to leave. Yeah, you know, grow, growing up in a town of like three to seven thousand people, um, seven thousand during the boom when they were building new power plants. We had a lot of migrant workers come in. They'd live there for a couple of years and work, and then they'd leave. So I think at the height, it was around 7,000 people. And I think they're back to like 2,500 down. So, you know, as a kid, you're looking at the big wide world and you just want to get the fuck out of there. And then when you become an adult and you see all the bullshit everywhere else, all you wish is to go home. To go home. So that's how it always is, isn't it? Oh, it's crazy. You know, but you know, it's changed over the years. It's, you know, my town is dwindling, uh, like with the, uh, attack on coal and fossil fuels. Now they've talked about shutting the mining down, shutting the plant down and that town will be gone. There won't be any, any other work opportunities at all there. And the really sad part is it's right on the edge of the Northern Cheyenne Indian reservation. And, uh, the only work that they have is to come over and work in coal strip at the plant and the mines. There's just nothing else out there. There's no other industry at all except maybe some logging. Is, is your father still alive? Is he still there? Oh, no. He croaked a long time ago. He had uh, lots of health issues. So, Gotcha. Yeah, uh, he's been gone, I don't know, 16 years now. What's, uh, when you were growing up, did you, did you play sports? What, what, was your, what was your jam in high school? Oh man, I played football, I ran track, I wrestled for a lot of years. Um but mostly I don't know, hunting, fishing, camping. All, all the uh, all the just, Montana things. Yeah, all the outdoor stuff, you know. When you lost your virginity, um, were you outside? Yes or no? Uh no, I was not. It was in my friend Ross Olmstead's trailer. <laughs> well his his parents pulled behind camper yeah it was it, it was classy it was classy dude <laughs> in a pull behind campers where you lost your virginity i, yeah, li- I like yeah. it how old were you uh 14 maybe whoa whoa that's a, that's a, look i think we all wish we were 14 but it never happens uh, usually you start dreaming about it around 13 or 14 and then it doesn't happen until 16 or 17. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes 18 or 19 in yeah. some cases. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> no, you know, there's just nothing else to do in Cold Strip, Montana. So <laughs> besides fuck, look, you, if you're going there, you can fuck you. You always have that. So, uh, was the girl yeah. your age? Was she older? No, my age. My that's age. cool. Yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> I'm sure my wife's going to love this podcast. <laughs> well, no, I, I look, I want to, I, I genuinely was serious when we talked before uh, we went on air. I was like, look, I'm going to ask you about your entire life because I'm, I, I, I genuinely want to know. And I think everybody else does too. And this is all part of it. I mean, look, my wife has heard my virginity stories and all, you know, all that other stuff. So ah, we're, we're all good. Um, did you go to college well, you know, after high school? When you're in a town, of, when you're in a town of 2,500, even if you're an average looking kid 
you, you're pretty much hot. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. I mean, hey man, what's a zit or two? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Did you did you yeah. up, did you go to college after that, or did you go to the military immediately right out of high school? Well, you know, my dad was a little odd. Uh, he refused to fill out the loan application for college because he said that it was none of their fucking business how much money I make. So really? I was limp. Yeah, I was kind of limited on uh, what to do next. I don't know if he was kidding or not, but I took it as serious. So I joined the military. I, w- I was actually an exchange student my junior year of high school to Germany. Really? How was that? Yeah. That, that always so, sounds like a blast, and you always hear about friends of yours doing it, but I, I, I've never met somebody or talked to somebody who actually did. How was it? Is yeah, it was it crazy? It, oh, man, it was awesome. I went to Hamburg, Germany. It was the first city I'd really ever been in. Um, it was a extreme culture shock. Plus, I was in an area where there were no Americans. Um, there were no bases up north like that. So um, the language immersion was complete. You, you either sank or swam. And, uh, man, it was awesome. I had a great host family. Uh, school didn't go so well because I never took a foreign language before. So, so I got you, you there. didn't know any German at all. Oh God, no! The stewardess on the way over taught me how to say yes, no. How much does that cost? And I'll take a beer. <laughs> so well, that's uh, that's only four <laughs> things you really need to know in this life, you know? Yeah. So when I landed in Germany, that's all I knew. I was 16 years old. The first thing I did was have a beer at the airport. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome and it went downhill from there i'm sure it did how how are the women there is is it as advertised i heard it's phenomenal oh it was amazing yeah they're you know what they were great people we had a great time over there or i did um i, I didn't always go to the school um i spent most of my day in the gym uh pretty much every day because i didn't understand a lick of, of german you know, I'd go for a month and then I'd take a month off. My host family didn't give a shit. Um, the, the, my host father was awesome. He told me the only thing he wanted, anyone who lived in their home had to be in some kind of sport, which was cool. But I, I enjoy that. That's cool. Did, so did you wrestle or what'd you do? No, it's Germany. They had fucking soccer. <laughs> that, that's all they had there was soccer? That's all I could find. And you know what? I am not a soccer person. I, I was like, I was like, no, uh, I've, I'm from America. We hit each other. That's way more fun. This whole kick a ball in the net thing just isn't my thing. So I found a gym and uh, I met a guy named Peter. Imagine that in Germany. That's uh, weird. Anyway, he was a Muay Thai instructor. He had been uh, in the German army as a hand-to-hand combat instructor for like six years. And he talked me into taking his class, and that was it. I stayed in Muay Thai the whole time I was there. So I'd get up in the morning, eat breakfast, and head out to Muay Thai, and I'd just spend the whole day in the gym punching bags and stuff. It was awesome. Ah, yeah, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a bad way of life at all. Um no, and then at the end of the year, I took a three-month tour. I did a, well, what we call it is Eurorail, but over there it's called Interrail. You buy a, a pass, and you can ride any train in Europe, anywhere it goes, anytime. For, and you buy a month at a time. So I bought a couple, three months worth of those. And one of the guys that uh, I met at the at the school there, he and I just traveled Europe for months just backpacked around that's amazing 16 17 years old just traveling all over europe man that's amazing yeah what countries did you go to oh shit which ones didn't i go to you tried you hit them all didn't you i think i i think by the time i turned 18 i'd been in 26 countries wow roughly that's, we that's, that's amazing. That's 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 like three times the, the, as many countries as I've been to, and it's sixteen yeah, and seventeen. That's really when you want to do it, and you don't know that until later in life. You do want to do it when you're young, but there's also a downside to that. You forget almost everything by the time you're forty. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, you can go back through some of your pictures and go, oh, shit, I remember that. <laughs> but you, you don't remember anything. Yeah, that's true. I, 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 I look back at, you know, co- like college is one of my fondest times. But you're right. I, I don't remember hardly any of it. I remember bits and pieces where you're like, oh, yeah, I did this and this. And if you look at pictures, you're like, I did that. But yeah, you're right. You, you don't really remember. No, you don't. And it, I don't know. I mean, now that I'm in this situation, old friends are popping out of the woodwork and reminding me of all the stupid shit I did when I was a kid. And it's kind of fun to relive some of this stuff. Like uh, the guy that got me onto drinking bros, uh, Robert, he and I sat and talked the other day, just back and forth about all the stupidity that we did when we were kids. Oh my God. <laughs> There's tons of it. It's a, it's a miracle. We're all still alive. Don't you feel that way? Yeah. We grew up in we grew up in a time where, uh, where, uh, natural selection was actually in play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like when Lost Boys came out and we went out and hung under a railroad bridge when the train went over just to see what it was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just all the stupid shit we did was awesome. <laughs> Um, and so when you came back from, from being in Europe, uh, did you go into the military right after high school? Yeah, I went, I went straight into the Navy. I had, I had the visions of grandeur that I was going to be a Navy SEAL and I was going to go see the world and kill people. And that didn't work out. I blew my ankle out even before I got there. Oh, shit. And I spent quite a few months on crutches. I tore all the ligaments and tendons out of my right ankle and I went to the fleet and luckily I had a job that I loved. Um, and I got put on gators out of San Diego. So we were a Marine Marine transport ships, the light helicopter assault landing craft type ships. And I was on the USS Bellowood. And then when desert shield started, uh, the Bellowood was going into dry dock and I knew damn well I didn't want to paint and scrape for the rest of my career. So I went out and volunteered to go. And I got moved over to uh, the USS New Orleans. And I went went over to Desert Shield and Storm from there. And how long were you in for? I did four active in the Navy. And then uh, during college, I had a little mishap I lost. Uh, my, I was staying with two friends and their house burned down and, uh, I was supposed to be the third roommate. I was in the process of moving in and, uh, they lost everything. And I lost about 80% of everything I owned and, uh, and it was already a struggle going to college with no support. So I ended up having to drop out. Um, I went to school in Bozeman, Montana at, um, Montana state. Okay. And, uh, it was funny because I got out of the Navy, went back home. I was visiting my parents at the time and I ran into Robert Julian walking down the street who had just got out of the army. And I said, what are you going to do now? He goes, I don't fucking know. He goes, what are you going to do? I go, I don't fucking know. We look at each other and we go, you want to go to college? (laughs) <laughs> so, we, so we both jumped in some beater ass car and drove up to Bozeman and signed up. That's great. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. And we were like a, we were like a week before classes started. So the housing, we couldn't find a place to live. We were answering ads and all we could find was a single bedroom in this house with these two girls and they were renting a room and Robert and I decided we'd just share a bedroom. I mean, this thing was tiny, man. No way. Were the girls hot <laughs> oh, God, at least? Yeah. Uh, one was. The other was not. <laughs> um, That's the way it always works out. That's the only. <laughs> they were they were sisters from Vermont, and the dad bought them a house while they were going to school. Wow. And one one was a sorority girl, and the other was a hippie. It, it was just the oddest combination of people you've ever seen. But it had to have been and a blast, they, right? And then they let two ex-military guys move in. <laughs> I mean, you we had like a futon mattresses on the floor with like a foot in between. You'd roll over and touch each other while you were Oof. sleeping. Oh god, it was bad. <laughs> but I bet but, you I bet you look back on it as a blast, right? Oh god, it was one of the best times ever, man. Robert and I got plowed one night and decided to make deer chili and 
instead of using the recipe, we substituted everything for a step hotter. Dude, this shit could have taken the paint off a battleship. <laughs> You've never had chili like that in your life. Or you made your elbows sweat. Wow. Yeah, I think that's where I might have got cancer. I'm not quite sure, but that <laughs> probably had something to do with it. Yeah, look, I would go back and tell the doctor about that, about the dear chili <laughs> man. See what he says. <laughs> See what he says. Oh, believe me, I've told the doctors more than you can imagine. Oh, boy, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But when they removed my butthole, I begged to take it home in a jar like tonsils. Stop it. <laughs> oh, God, I wanted it bad. What did the, the, leather, what did the doctor say? He just stared at me. I mean, they all just stare at you. They're not used to it. <laughs> so, you know, he's, excuse he's me, sir? You, I, l- I love my butthole back, please. He's giving you the worst news in the whole fucking world, and your response is, can I take it home with me? <laughs> You know, the old leather Cheerio floating around in a mason jar just would have been a focal talking point at my house. Oh, man, that would have been great. If you put it in a formaldehyde jar so you could see it. <laughs> oh, God, it would be awesome. And then and, and then when he said no, I said, well, can you leave a six-inch pocket for my hunting buddies? They want to know. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Oh, hell yeah, I did. Oh, my. <laughs> I mean, I'm... I'm laughing near tears over here. Well, <laughs> what did the doctor say? Like, like oh, what was his? What was his final? Was he just like, "Hey, you can just get get, get the fuck out of here. Take your cancer, actually, yeah, and get the fuck out of here." Actually, that surgeon was fucking hilarious. He started laughing. Oh, I also I also told him that my luck was so bad I could run through the titty forest and slip on a dick. And <laughs> he goes, he goes, can I, can I borrow that? And I said, Hey, it's a free world. I didn't make it up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm stealing it from you right now and you don't even know it. So, <laughs> so when I told him, when I asked if he could leave a six inch pocket, he just looked down, he puts his hand on my shoulder. He goes, when, when you're all healed up, you and I are going for a steak dinner downtown. <laughs> <laughs> it never happened, but <laughs> that's really fucking funny. <laughs> Oh shit. So, uh, after, after college, after the military, um, how did you become a firefighter? Well, yeah, that's another one. Uh, so I was, I worked, uh, I took a job selling cell phones for, well, I sold computer and technology for a friend of mine. He's ex army. That was one of those, uh, computer security guys. He started a small computer company, which has now grown into, three states and multiple cities he's doing really well that's awesome i didn't know i didn't know shit about computers other than how to sign on to aol once in a while and send an email but i ended up working with him and uh from there um things got it you know there were slow times and busy times so i ended up selling cell phones when they first came out and i was an outside sales rep so I would travel to ranches and anywhere that somebody might want a cell phone, I'd just go knock on their doors. And I made, I think I made like eighty-five or ninety thousand dollars that year. Really? Yeah, Holy Montana shit. was. Well, Montana didn't have cell phone towers, so when they started going in, it was like the the wave of the future, you know? Yeah. And in Montana, having a phone just for safety in the winter, everyone wanted one. So that lasted about a year and a half. And then they, you know, then it became so normal that they started open stores and making it a retail item. So you didn't get the huge commissions anymore. Gotcha. And when that dried up, I kind of dried up because I, with no college degree and looking for a sales position somewhere, they looked at your prior pay records and they were like, shit, I'm not hiring this guy. I can't pay him that. So, I joined the National Guard. I walked in and I just said, uh, I want the longest school you have. And they said, well, that's ranger school. And I said, I'm a little old and out of shape for ranger school. What else you got? They said, well, we have a uh, we have a firefighting unit here. So they drove me out. I talked to the first sergeant. And I was like, holy shit, these are like real firefighters. They had crash fire rescue trucks. They did structure and airport firefighting, wildland. So I spent a few days out there just bullshitting with that guy. 
and decided that's what I wanted to do. So the army sent me down to uh, San Angelo, Texas, and I spent five months down there going through the academy. When I got back, I spent three months and I couldn't find work that paid enough to even allow me to live. So I decided that's it. I got to travel. I started traveling around the country, trying out for fire departments, ended up out here. And, and, And how long were you working at that fire department before you got the diagnosis? Oh, shit. Um, it was 2008. Uh, nine years. Oh, wow. Man, so you, yeah. I, I bet you were pretty close with all those guys. <laughs> no. Really? Uh, no, not really. To be honest with you, um, I don't want, I don't know if I even want to go there. But I, no, you, let's look, just, look, yeah, let's you just say, I've, let's just say I've been retired for three years and I've heard from two of them. Man, I'm sorry to hear that. So, yeah, it's kind of an eat your young kind of place out here, I think. Gotcha. There's there's really not much of a brotherhood in this area. Gotcha. Yeah, guys are, I guess it's all, you know, where you're from and, and uh, it, you know, varies from department to department, I would imagine, right? Uh, you know, I'm not, they did some really good things for me. They submitted me for a uh, a benefit when it was really bad in a local South, the South Bend Fire Department actually did a benefit for me. It was a uh, a golf outing, and without that, I would probably would have lost my house and vehicles and everything else. It was during the worst part of this. I was at home for eight months and couldn't work. Um, I almost lost my job. The guys covered my shifts for me. They covered eight or nine shifts. Um, and then when I had the liver surgery that all started back over and they did a pancake breakfast, but you know, it's some of the comments were, you know, we worked for you because it sets precedence. Now the city won't, will have to let us do it for other people. And like, that's like the rudest shit you can say to somebody, you know, we didn't do it for you. We did it to set precedence. So, you know, there were ups and downs. There's a lot of good people on the department. It's just, None of them were that close. Yeah, yeah. I, it's strange because um, you hear stories and you you always wonder, uh, you know, that it is a, a brotherhood and all that other stuff. And and again, I look I, I, from what I've heard. Obviously, I'm not a firefighter, nor have I worked at a fire department. But it it, it is by department by departments. Um, it is. It is. Some of it's the political climate. Some of it's. I, I think most of it was I'm an outsider. I moved to this town. I didn't grow up here. Almost everyone on the fire department has brothers, cousins, fathers, um, long history of being on the department. So, you know, I never really quite fit in. I, I never accepted into that. Um, I grew up here fold. So, Gotcha. A- any thought of going back to Montana after you got the diagnosis? Yeah, I took my wife out there for about a month. We did a long vacation and just had a great time. But um, no, I, I, I want, mean, yeah, we I, wanted, I meant like personally, just uh, you know. Yeah, well, we wanted I, after we on the way home, my wife goes, "Why don't we move?" And I was like, "All right, let's do it." And uh, then the liver popped up, and it was like, "How do you?" My wife grew up here. Her family's here. Her friends are here. How do you remove her from that support system and take her somewhere she knows no one and right. just leave her there? You know, because um, when it went to the liver, we we pretty much knew it was terminal, but there was still hope. So we just held on to that. But, uh, yeah, she was totally up for it. She was ready to go after she saw it. Yeah. And the the reason why, the reason why I ask is, you know, it's one of those things where I think everybody in their mind has a, if you get news like this, has a, has a spot that they want to, you know, know, finish out their life. If I wouldn't have been married, I would, well, actually, if I wouldn't have got married, I'd be dead because I never would have got checked and I probably just would have let it go. I wouldn't have even gotten treatment at that point. And especially now that I know what you have to go through in this stupid fight. Um, actually, I take that back. I probably would have done it, but I wouldn't have made it this far. That's for damn sure. 
Speaking of, so, speaking of your wife, where did you meet her? In a bar. Where else? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there anywhere else you meet people? No, not anymore. Not anymore. I didn't, not I didn't every, think everybody's so. Tinder. Yeah. Everybody's Tinder yeah. these days. Nobody, uh, nobody's going to bars anymore and picking up their wives. Ah, oh, fuck! I probably would have swept left anyway. <laughs> <laughs> how, how old were you? And uh, and 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 what what year did you meet her? I was thirty eight. I met her in probably two thousand six, five oh, okay. or six. Gotcha. She, so you, you've been married for a long time now. At this point. Uh, what is it? 11 years, man, man, 11 years. That's amazing. What, what's her name? It feels like forever. Yeah. Well, it is. Look, I'm, <laughs> I've been married for five and it feels like forever. So yeah, uh, yeah. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. After, after the first like three or four, you're like, well, it's, it feels like forever now at this point. So <laughs> she's going to love hearing that too. Um, <laughs> after this air, she, hear, she hears it every day. She's used to me. Trust me. Uh, so now, her, yeah, her name's Angie. Her name's Angie. And, and what does Angie do for a living? Uh, right now she's on FMLA, but she works as a customer service rep for a company. Okay, cool. Um, have you, have you guys, uh, do you, do you have any kids is the, is the next obvious question? No, uh, being married only eight months, we didn't even have a chance. So man, is that, that so, is that something you always wanted? No, actually I never wanted it. Um, but when the diagnosis came through, I realized that was probably really selfish. And, you know, the only thing that you leave behind in this life that lasts, I, you can just throw all the shit you own right out the window because you're just a caretaker. So the only thing that you leave behind when you leave this earth is family. Right. That's it. I mean, if you don't have kids, you left nothing. Yeah. It has, uh... And sorry for the the long pause here. I just uh, have you had this discussion with your wife before? Of like, I wish we would have done. We I wish we would have had children. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, neither of us planned on kids at all. Neither of us wanted them. We were old, little older than your standard new parents, and you know, at thirty eight years old, you know, it's doable. But it it would have been pretty tough. You know. Yeah to start to start at an age like that but you know more and more people are doing it but i never really had any interest in having kids and then uh like i said when i was diagnosed everything your thoughts change and it, you start thinking about like what the hell um i got nothing to leave right. so you know like like going through my old shit in the basement and throwing it out because it means absolutely nothing to anyone but me. And you're going through all that stuff and you're like, there's nobody to give it to. Like my brother and his kids, like, what are they going to do with it? Right. So, you know, I just been systematically tossing out every memory I've ever had. I think that's probably the hardest part. Like over the last couple of weeks, my brother drove up and I loaded his car with all our, all my guns and send them home with them because I, I didn't want to sell them. A lot of them were my dad's, um, and I just felt it was better just to keep them in the family. And yeah, I, yes, I got. I got to imagine that's difficult. But it, it, did your wife try to stop you at all and say, "Hey, no, I, I'd like to keep this stuff just to have you know memories of you"? No, because they were all memories of before us. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. There, there's certain things she'll keep, but for the most part, none of it means shit to her. I mean, it, it was long before we met. She doesn't know old friends. She's like, I'm showing her pictures and she's like, who's that? And I'm like, I don't even remember who that is. <laughs> but I knew him at one point enough to get a photo with him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and look back then when you got a photo with them, it, it, it took some, it took some time. You had to go get it processed. 
you know? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and by a and by that spinning bulb thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. It was not, hey, this is on my phone, or look, it's in portrait mode. Nope. You had to go and get that processed at a at a place. And it was like, we'll have this ready in seventy two hours, forty eight to seventy two yeah, hours. And that made for some awkward junk shots oh, when you yeah. had to take you had to take them to the pharmacy and that <laughs> big fruit basket pops out of the slider. <laughs> you know, all you can do is look at the lady and go, I'm sorry. I'm didn't, sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know that was there. You just saw 38 pictures of my penis and I am sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, where'd you guys get married at you and your wife? Uh, just right here in town. I rented a little hall. That's cool. Did you guys go on a honeymoon or anything? Uh, <laughs> I went on a honeymoon with my buddy Doug two weeks after I got married. We went moose hunting in Canada. <laughs> I'm sure she was super stoked about that. She knew ahead of time. Uh, on my behalf, the hunting trip was planned before the wedding. Okay. Okay. So so that was just, oops. Yeah. Um, later on, we did. We went down to uh, Asheville, South Carolina in the fall, and we went and tinkered around like the Biltmore Manor and did some other stuff like that it was just nice get away just be by ourselves yeah it's it's gorgeous down there uh i'm in i'm in north Carolina. i've been i've been through there before um it's great it's great oh yeah so the looking, biltmore is incredible oh yeah biltmore's uh, amazing um i could spend a week in that place i know i know it's fantastic isn't it uh so wonder we, what it's like wonder what it's like to be that fucking rich yeah right <laughs> i mean Man, when you really think about it, now that you know you're 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 down the home stretch here, do you really think about that? Of like, fuck, man, I wish I just had a shit ton of money so I could really light it the fuck up right now. Uh, yeah, and then I think better of that because the only thing that would come of that is probably jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, me with a pocket full of money right now would not be a very good thing. Yeah, I'm looking at your Facebook page right now, and you've got a gigantic bottle of of it. Look, it appears to be champagne in your mouth. Yeah, it was a it was a display bottle at the uh, casino steakhouse. Some friends took us out to dinner with them the other night. <laughs> oh, so this, just, this is recently. Oh uh, yeah, that was like last week. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah, so I snatched it up and just pretended to drink it. It was great. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. Um, there's something on your Facebook page about a guy being banned from Walmart. <laughs> that was just a joke. Oh, I it think is. It's funny. It is. Yeah, that, that was funny as shit. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't know if it was true or not, so I was going to tre- <laughs> tread lightly with it, where I was like, man, did you really no, get pr- banned from your local Walmart just because you could? <laughs> no, but I've been I've been kicked out of Walmart a couple times. <laughs> I mean, where else do you go after the bars close? That's true. Oh, look, look, and you're already true. banned from. And if you're already banned from Denny's, that kind of narrows it down to Walmart. Yeah, Waffle House. You know, Waffle House is pretty much the only thing left on there. Yeah, but they don't have little kids' bikes to ride around. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and if you can't ride a little kid's bike around the, uh, the Walmart, then were you really in the Walmart? It's probably what you need to ask yourself. That's what I'm saying. Uh, is there anything left on on uh, on your list? Um, anybody you're going to call? Any you know meals you want to have? Like, uh, what do you go through mentally? You know, with with a diagnosis like this. Shit, I don't know. Um, you know, honestly, uh, one of my biggest things. I, I got. I, I don't necessarily consider. Uh, regret but when i was diagnosed i had just broke into a a career as a professional bow hunter i'd been writing for magazines and online magazines for a couple years um i was uh, pro staff for bowtech and diamond archery um uh, i'd been doing i'd done a couple filmed hunts things like that and i did i didn't really like the filming but when you're ugly, the only real f- film career that you can break into is hunting. I mean, look at those guys on TV. You know, even I could fit into that. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> no, I was a very avid outdoorsman and bow hunter. And um, I had I broke into writing. I submitted a couple articles and they liked it and they put me on their staff. 
And then I started writing for other magazines and doing things. And I was just starting to get invited for like camera hunts. And as a firefighter, I could take, you know, a month and a half off every hunting season. So it would have been perfect. And uh, that all fell through when I got sick. So I had to give all of it up. But now I got this tube in my lung and it's hunting season and I can't really pull the bow anymore. Uh, the cold air hurts my lungs and I'm not sure if I should shoot a gun or not. I I didn't ask, um, but the tube goes in your side through your rib cage and then it hangs down below your lung and it floats there. And if you take an impact, that hose flips up and slams into your lung. It's not pleasant. Yeah. So I'm afraid to shoot a gun now. I'm afraid that I, I I don't even know if I I'm supposed to fly or not. Um I don't know what the pressures would do with a open hole in my side. So I, I've been just kind of taking it easy. But as far as like bucket list shit, I have no idea. I mean, I've done so much in my life. You know, I think I've been in thirty three countries now when you count the Middle East and, you know, over on that side of the world. So, um, I don't know. I've, I'm traveled. My wife really kind of wants to get away and take a vacation, but I don't even walking too far, you know, 50 yards, I'm pretty much done. So I don't know. I'm just kind of taking it day by day. I got so many great friends out here. Like, uh, one of my buddies, we hang out at a little brewery. I know Assless Pats is going to come up, so we might as well fucking talk about it, right? Yeah. So we hang out at this little brewery. It's only about two miles from my house, and they do really, they do really cool shit down there. They're a bunch of young guys, and they they specialize in small batch brewing. They just brew weird shit. Like they have a Funyun IPA. They brew it with Funyuns. What's the name of the brewery? <laughs> It's called Burnham. Okay. And uh, they, uh, so my buddy went down there and we had jokingly, not really jokingly, but um, when I first got diagnosed this last time, I had gone in and we were hanging out with, the, there's, there's like five or six owners. They're all young and they pooled in to do this. And we were talking and I told them, I want to make my own beers before I go. And it was kind of like, yeah, we should do that sometime. And then it went on for months and months and nothing happened. And uh, so my buddy went down there and pressured them and they surprised me, snuck me, snuck me down there for a beer and it was, it was closed. And I'm like, they don't open for two hours. He goes, they'll let us in. You know that. So we walked up and they put me in back and they said, today's the day you're making a beer. And I was like, oh shit cool <laughs> so we made assless pats and that was great no way that's yeah, really fucking just, funny oh yeah so anyway the point of that is like i've got some really really good friends that are that are trying to make this fun and better so they're doing things like making the beer and the brewery is like totally on board and they had so much fun and it sold it's literally sold out in three and a half hours. They've never had a beer go that fast. They went through two kegs in three and a half hours. Man. That place that place had a line out the front door and all the way to the street for like an hour. That's amazing. Yeah, it was. And it, it luckily it turned out to be good because we were worried. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, the way I made the, the way I made the recipe was, Hey, what kind of hops is this? Why isn't it open? Oh, we don't use that one. All right. We're using this one. <laughs> <laughs> what else don't you use? <laughs> we'll put that all inside the beer and then serve hundreds of people. <laughs> and that is exactly how I made that recipe. I had no fucking idea what I was doing. Uh, they have a computer program that balances up all of it out. So what color do you want it to be? And I'd say, I don't know, like a good morning piss. <laughs> and boom, there it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I spent like six and a half hours down there that day learning to brew it and brewing it. We ground the grain. We did everything. It was so awesome. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I'm grateful you took the time to, to chat with me today. Um, I'm grateful you're on the show. Uh, and it sounds like you've lived an unbelievable life. This is, this is actually the first time, you know, we've done 350 something episodes at this point. I, this is the first time I'm going to ask you, ask a guest this, um, is there a, we do the drinking bro of the week. Um, but for you, we're going to do a drinking bro of your life. Who is the drinking bro of your life? Um, and it could be a, a man or a woman who's, who's the one person that has helped you out in this world through your, all, all your years on this earth so far. Wow. You know what? I can't say that there's any one person. It takes a village to build, uh, you know, a good it, life. It, it takes, yeah, it takes everyone to build someone into who they are. It's every experience. It's every person, whether you know them or not. I mean, there's people that have written me, um, from drinking bros that, uh, well, I might as I've been contacted by at least five people that were going to kill themselves. We'll just put it that way. Man. And telling me that they want me to keep writing all my stupidity and all the crap that I keep putting on there. And that's why I keep doing it. And they've influenced me. Um, I think right now in the last probably seven years there's a a gentleman here in town uh his name is steve moore he's the president of our wall gang which is a veteran support motorcycle club and i was the vice president of another veteran support club and i was kind of getting disillusioned with it it wasn't going well the group uh had a little infighting and stuff and it just wasn't going smooth i didn't feel like i fit there anymore and uh, I moved over to the wall gang and started with riding with the National Veterans Awareness Organization. Um, shameless plug, they ride coast to coast every May from Sacramento, California to Washington, D.C. And along the journey, we stop at veterans' homes, hospitals, and schools. And we teach the kids w- about what it is to be a veteran and the sacrifice that many of our brothers and sisters have given. And when we visit the homes, we spend time in the rooms with the veterans. And oftentimes it's the only visitors they'll have all year. And they so look forward to us coming in and, and, you know, even the hour or two that we get to spend at the home. Um, it, it's life changing um, because of the people that are, are riding mainly and the people that you might meet like i've met some of the last living survivors of the u.s arizona um i was sitting uh we did a bingo day in grand island nebraska and i sat with this gentleman and he looked really healthy and i said uh so how long have you been in, in here for he says uh about seven months and I looked down and he's got a cast on his leg. And I'm like, seven months for a bum leg? And he goes, well, this is a lifetime injury. He said, it's finally getting to the point where they might have to take it off. And I said, well, what happened? He says, well, I was in Korea. And my, uh, my unit got pinned down on the side of a mountain. And they killed everyone but me. And he goes, so I just buried myself in the mud and waited to, you know, he goes, it's all I could do is pretend I was dead. He said, I was out there overnight and the ground froze and my, my leg was in a block of ice. And in the morning when the battalion moved up the hill, they had to, uh, they were breaking weapons and making a fire out of the stocks to melt his feet out of the ground. Wow. You know, just stories like that. And you're, you're like, holy shit. And, you know, being Navy, I was in indirect combat, especially in intelligence. They keep you as far away from it as possible. You know, we took a little bit of small arms fire here and there, but nothing, you know, nothing even close. So I didn't have the combat experience. So when I got out of the military, I never felt like a real veteran because I didn't see combat. 
I don't know why people feel like that because it takes seven non-combat people to put one in the field and keep them alive. And in my job path in intelligence, um, a lot of the briefings and stuff I gave probably did save a lot of lives. So I never really thought about it. So when I got out, I didn't really bring up I was in the military a lot of the time. I didn't, I didn't think it was that big a deal. And uh, when I started riding with these guys and talking to these Vietnam vets, and there were other people that had survivor's guilt, and just to sit on a hill down in the Pentagon parking lot during Rolling Thunder and having these conversations with these guys and listening to their stories and them telling you, that's bullshit, you're a veteran, you should be proud of it. Um, things like that. Um, so the guy that brought me in, his name is Steve Moore. He's in the Indiana Veterans Hall of Fame. He's an Air Force veteran, uh, Vietnam era. Um, he was a jet mechanic, but he's one of the biggest proponents of veterans rights and helping veterans that I've ever met in my life. He's one of the best people. And, you know, for only knowing him closely for about five, six years now, um, he's really changed everything in my life recently. Taking me on these trips with, um, um, like last year, I couldn't, or this year, actually, I couldn't afford to go. Being this close and knowing my situation, every dime I spend takes away money from my wife that she's going to need shortly. So I didn't want to go because of that. And, it, you know, each man pays his own way, and women. And um, that's another thing that I've been seeing, too, is we as guys always look to other guys like they're the veterans and you go into these hospitals, there's women everywhere that served. And a lot of them have been, you know, maybe not in direct combat, but they've, they've been in the shit and we just walk by them or a lot of people do. And that needs to change. We need to start seeing our females as veterans and they're one of us. And these are things that I've learned through this organization, and it's just awesome, man. But it costs about, I'm guessing, between three and $4,000 to go on that trip. It's 21 days long. <laughs> so I wasn't going to go. And these guys all pitched in and, and made me go, basically. So just this past May, I did a 21-day journey across the country on a motorcycle again. That was my fourth trip. So um, I owe a lot to Steve. He's probably, he's someone I look up to. Uh, no, I know, I, man, he, he sounds like an amazing person. Um, you know, but I don't want to take away from my closest friends either, you know? No, Mark not at and, all. Not at all. You I, know, Mark and Doug, they're not veterans. And my heart lies in the veteran community more than anything because that's who I am. Sure. But, you know, I've hunted with these guys for years. I mean, everyone has really pitched in to make my end a lot better than it has, you know, than it, than it would have been. So it, it's, it's just freaking awesome. And I, and obviously you know? your wife, I would imagine too, right? Yeah. Um, she's kind of closed. She's not, I mean, she's, she's open and fun, but she doesn't, walk up to strangers and say hi like i do i just i'll talk to anybody and so she's a little more closed she doesn't have very uh diverse group of friends and all my friends kind of focus on me a little too much and the, the more focal point in anything should be the spouse because I'm limited. She's going to still be here. She's going to need the help. And a lot of it should be about her too. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's an excellent point because I, I think that often gets overlooked, um, you know, during, uh, things like this, of this nature, uh, what, what, what the spouse is going through. It is, you know, it, I, I'm the one that's going to have the easy part. Really. If you think about it, I'm not going to have to worry about bills. I'm not going to have to worry about who's watching the dogs while I'm at work. 
you know, all my troubles are going to be gone and more troubles are going to be building for her than even now. So, you know, my focus right now is on just making sure she's comfortable and she has what she needs and can get through. And that's really all that matters right now. The rest of it, like I said, everything I own is just stuff. Everything I've done is done. And the experience is now like a bucket list thing. Like, what have you always wanted to do? You know, there's a shitload I wanted to do, but it's too late. And now it's just about, you know, just trying to be the right, the good person. You know, somebody asked me the other, <laughs> they asked me the other day, is, why don't you go on a shooting spree and take a few assholes with you? I'm just thinking about that karma showing, <laughs> yeah. showing up at the pearly gates and <laughs> you know, what'd you do in your life? Well, I brought a couple molesters with me. Can we punish them for a while? <laughs> you know? Sorry, Patrick. And, that's not how this works. That's what, that's what, that's what God's going to say to you. Uh, well, I'm not quite. You never know. I mean, I don't know. I haven't spoken to the man. You know, maybe he'd be happy. Fuck if I know. But, but you know what? I mean, it's just I don't know. I'd sure like to. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we all would. You know. <laughs> and you always talk shit right up until the moment that you can. Yeah. So, the, so, so the very end, uh, have you, I, I know this sounds crazy, but have you thought about what you want your last words to be? Cause that's another thing that, that we all say, you know, as, uh, as friends to each other of like, man, I would just want to say, fuck you to somebody or whatever that is, you know? <laughs> well, I shouldn't spill the beans on this, but, uh, you, you probably, if you've been watching my posts, you probably read the story about when I found out I, cancer went to my liver and I went out and I got a couple of quarts of moonshine and by noon I couldn't even talk. <laughs> and, uh, my buddy came over and, uh, I was in the backyard. I was just wearing a pair of pajama pants as so if the fly was broken. I'm hanging out everywhere and I'm just sloppy drunk. I don't really remember most of this day, <laughs> but I was just sloppy pissed drunk. And people started driving into the driveway and we start drinking beers and, and they're trying to talk me down. And I go in the house and I got a rifle. I come running out in the backyard and just dump an entire magazine downrange. So my buddy, Mark, he comes over to me and he goes, he brings up a bullhorn he had in his car. He's a high school coach for, I don't know what he coached soccer or some shit. <laughs> And he gives me a bullhorn and he goes, I'll trade you this for the rifle. And I was like, okay. So, (laughs) so now he's in the house with my wife hiding all the guns and I'm outside with a bullhorn standing on the roof. I climbed on the roof. I'm yelling, go fuck yourself neighbors. (laughs) Oh God, it was bad. My wife ordered a pizza. The pizza delivery guy shows up. And I sneak around, I'm low crawling through the driveway. I pop up behind him and scream, pizza guy, go fuck yourself. No way. Oh, swear to God. And then two weeks later, I ordered a pizza. He shows up and I pay him, give him his tip. I turn around and he stands there and he goes, I said, what? (laughs) I turn around and he goes, no, go fuck myself this time. (laughs) And I said, oh, I'm sorry. Go fuck yourself. And I shut the door. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh that's fucking epic <laughs> there's so much more to that day i'm My sure butt. i'm sure after after receiving that news after that i'm i'm sure you just said fuck it to, to everything my, my wife kept walking by and tucking me back in she goes and gets a piece of tape and tries to tape my pajama bottoms and it just didn't work no need <laughs> At that and point, though, just, no, no need. Let it, let it hang. Let it hang. You know. Oh God, it was fucking funny. <laughs> I guess. I, I, like I said, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, that, it's one of those things where later on, whenever you get that drunk and your wife isn't, um, it's funny. It's really funny to us. It's not so funny to them, where they're like, "Okay, okay." Yeah, and in my life, it's usually the other way around. Oh, is it really? <laughs> oh yeah, she can pile them down. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's great. Well, it sounds like you married a, a good woman. Um, Patrick, look, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've absolutely enjoyed this last I don't know, hour and whatever we've talked together, man. It's, it's been a pleasure getting to, to chat with you and know you and, uh, you know, all of us from the drinking community, drinking bros community, love you. And, uh, our, our thoughts are with you every single day. Um, yeah, that's a mistake. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, it is. We, we should call, we should have called somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but just, in all sincerity, we, we, we really do love you. And, um, uh, man, I, it's hard to, it's hard to know what to say to end an interview like this. Um, other than we love you and our thoughts are with you. Uh, I'm not defined by cancer, so don't worry about it. There's acceptance. I, you know, after this long of fight, it, you don't have to say shit. I'm, I'm still here and I'm still alive and that's all that matters. It's not, like I said, it isn't about tomorrow. It's about today. And that's what everyone needs to start thinking about. Um, you know, that you don't have to fear everything. There's, there's very little that you have to fear. I mean, shit, we're all going to die. It's just a matter of when that's one thing you ain't getting out of yeah. ever. So, you know, it, it just sucks for everyone else that you leave behind. But for me, you know, I'm not looking forward to it, but also it's going to happen. You can't change it. So why fight it? You know, that's, that's one thing that you cannot fight. It's probably the only thing I can't fight. Well, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't say win. I just said fight. Sure. I, you, you can't win everything. And this is just something that happened. And, it's not going to change. And I, what else can you do? Yeah. Well, I'd say what you want. Do you want to end it with telling me to go fuck myself? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of those cards handed out at my funeral. I have a feeling. <laughs> I, They're going to open up too. a blank card and all it's going to say is go fuck yourself. <laughs> go fuck yourself. And it's the last message from Patrick Gordon. Um, <laughs> Patrick Gordon, I, I appreciate you being on the show and uh, and, and sharing uh, the, the time with us that you have left. Um, Thanks, Ross. No, the honor is all mine, man. I, I, uh, I didn't expect this. I didn't. It's to you know, I'm just an average dude sitting here bored to death and playing on the Internet. So I am glad that I've helped quite a few people and i i really appreciate them reaching out and telling me that i did because it really makes these last few months worthwhile it really does and i, I you know i wish i could say people by name but that wouldn't be right and i will never do it so all right but i really i do really appreciate the people who have reached out and told me i helped them yeah, I've meant a lot. And, and look, I'm 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 definitely not going to pry. That's why I said all right. So uh, we'll we'll leave those people um, who've had those personal interactions with you uh, alone. Uh, you know, in the meantime, I'm glad to have have had this personal interaction with you, uh, Patrick Gordon. Uh, I love you, buddy. Um, for Patrick Gordon, I'm Ross Patterson. This is Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. <laughs>